And with that, I think I'll introduce Dr. Miller, who really doesn't need any introduction now since this is his second home here in the carriage house. Um, but it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Howard Miller. He's a professor emeritus in history and religious studies at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, he's one of our Wallace scholars. Across the country, we have eight or nine folks that um, are Wallace scholars. They do a lot of the research for us, so we don't have to, um, and feed us good information. He's an award-winning educator, a leading scholar on Ben-Hur and Lou Wallace's life, a native of Texas. Um, he did move away for a while, but then he went back to the University of Texas, Austin, where he taught for 40 years, retired in 2011, which is getting to be a while. Um, during his time at UT, he was instrumental in founding the University's Department of Religious Studies. Um, he was a recipient of several awards for teaching excellence, and he's been involved with us since about 2000, um, so going on 20 years. He supported the museum in lots of different ways, and the one that's really special to me is the magic lantern slides that he helped us restore and conserve. And they were, we had them as a feature in last year's um, exhibit. And if you really were intrigued by them, you can get a little postcard of the magic lantern set we have in the gift shop. He's spoken on a number of Ben Hur related topics, including the less familiar, um, one of the least familiar adaptations of the novel. Last time he was here, he talked about the stage play which ran between 1899 and 1920, seen by 20 million people, which is just a phenomenal number of people. The stage play was a very exciting thing um, in the evolution of the Ben Hur story. Um, Dr. Miller's written a lot. Um, one of his essays entitled In Service of Christianity, Ben Hur and Redemption of the American Theater. Um, we also have that essay included in a book that's in our gift shop called Bigger Than Ben Hur. So if you don't get enough of Ben Hur, uh, we can help you out. Um, because Dr. Miller did talk about the stage play last time he was here, and part of the importance of that is the role it played in overcoming American religious opposition to um, people attending the theater. Just as the novel from which, ben, from which the stage play was adapted helped the Victorian audience overcome their opposition to reading novels. And I think some of the attendance of the movie for the 1925 movie that's going to talk about tonight also been her open doors for that audience. Um, Dr. Miller is going to be talking about the first filming of Ben Hur that was authorized by the family. I don't know if you're going to mention the unauthorized version, but um, <laughs> but the 1925 um, screen silent screen epic um, was of great significance to the history of Hollywood, and it really changed audience expectations for what you could expect from the film when it was released in 25. So, without any further ado, I'm going to take my papers and let. Dr. Miller Stark. Are any of you getting over one of these colds that will never end? <laughs> Myself. Uh, I have no idea if I'm going to be able to do this. Uh, if not, uh, Stephanie is going to film my downfall. <laughs> I, if I felt good, I could give this talk and show my slide and show my movie in an hour. I don't know what's going to happen today. So uh, Larry said he's going to lock the door <laughs> and we're going to serve the wine afterwards. <laughs> I feel a lot better if I don't feel like I have to get ready you know, just within, within 40 minutes, something like that. All righty. I'm going to come back in July. By the way, I've, I've been in this in this town for a long time in many, many different seasons. I've never seen the trees bloom before. Oh. <laughs> Magnolias. <laughs> <laughs> ah, just magnificent. Yeah. Coming back in July sometime and talking about the 1959 film. And then in October, I'm going to come back and talk about, about the tradition that that film began. There have been two Ben Hur traditions. One, we're going to talk about the end of tonight. 59 film starts another one, and we just saw that guy, Mr. Houston, uh, end it too. So it's, it hasn't ended yet, but we've got two, two of them still. So, okay. I need to start. I have no idea if I can talk, stand up, cough, and also handle machinery. <laughs> this wonderful man. Is he like a saint? <laughs> this is St. Kevin Brownlow, an Englishman a little older than I am. 
And he is the world's leading authority on the silent film. And he has written a book called The Parade's Gone By. I've been trying forever to get someone to tell me what that means. I don't know. But in this, there is an article on The Silent Ben-Hur. The Silent Ben-Hur is the only one of the adaptations of Ben-Hur that has readily available and accessible, readable survey. And this is it. The heroic fiasco. <laughs> All right, now have I done everything I was supposed to? All right, let's see if I can do this. Larry mentioned the stage play. I decided to do some things with the film tonight that my kind of idiosyncratic research has prepared me to do. More than anything else, my research on the 20-year touring history of the stage play led me to appreciate the several important ways in which the staged version of Ben-Hur led to and then influenced the creation and substance of the silent film. That's the basic what I'm talking about tonight. The stage Ben-Hur was wildly popular and sold out performances everywhere during the first decade of the touring history at the beginning of the 20th century. But in the second decade, the production's popular appeal clearly declined. No, ha no matter how many times the producers, Mark Claw, this is Mark, Mark Claw and Abraham Erdinger spruced up the sets and costumes, the basic storyline and the mechanics of the play never changed and got creakier and creakier. But the play continued to tour because of the contract that Lou and his son Henry made with Claw and Erlinger that obligated the producers to mount a touring season every year and be terminated if they didn't do it. So they just kept on. I was fascinated during my research on the stage play to watch what happened from about 1917 to around 1920 as the producers struggled to keep the show on the road. Earlier in the century, Claw and Erlinger flooded the cities where, they, where the play would perform with tons of PR for weeks before the play opened. By 1917, the play often came to the town or city with very little or no fanfare at all. I also noticed that the aging stage play now had to compete with a growing number of touring theatrical companies, performing classical musicians, and with an ever-increasing number of moving pictures or photo plays, as they, as they were often called. In fact, in 1917, the Ben-Hur Touring Company found itself competing in Indianapolis with a new western that starred William S. Hart, who had created the original masala for the stage play in 1899. Maybe it's time to give it up, guys. <laughs> the producers at times grudgingly admitted that the production was aging and no longer all that exciting. And by 1916, the tired, kicking <coughs> treadmill race of the stage been her had to compete with an electrifying scene from D.W. Griffith's Birth of the Nation in which literally hundreds of mounted and hooded clansmen raced to rescue a southern village from the alleged depredations of murderous and rapacious black men. How are you going to repeat with that? <laughs> By 1920, as moving pictures became more and more elaborate and realistic, the Claw and Erdinger publicists grew ever more creative in defending the obvious artifice of staged chariot races and sea battles. Their defense was an ingenious one. They emphasized that, artificial or not, all of the action that took place on stage <laughs> was performed by real, live beings. <laughs> As opposed to what? The last ads for the stage play boasted rather defensively, I thought, and kind of pathetically, that the production featured 300 living actors in the gorgeous spectacle and 20 living horses in the blood-quickening chariot race. Between 1917 and 21, while the stage play became uh, the stage play more or less faded, Henry was besieged by a veritable who's who of Hollywood moguls, each of them eager to purchase the rights to film Ben Hur, which was universally understood to be the most valuable literary product property ever. I have always believed that Henry essentially played for time as a very wily man, just like his daddy. Play for time, looking for the best deal, and I suspect giving the film industry time to mature so that be worthy of Ben Hur. 
He negotiated with D.W. Griffith, perhaps the most powerful director of the age, and here in a dashing straw hat, and with Rex, the very suave, Rex Ingram, a serious competitor for that title, and with the married Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. Mm -hmm. Top of the line. Mm -hmm. Abraham Erlinger was also determined to be in on the deal, and as the owner of the rights to dramatize Ben-Hur, he believed that he should be involved in any negotiations about filming the novel. The, the conflict between Henry Lane Wallace and these two men, particularly Abe, Abe uh, Erlinger, is one of the most wonderfully exciting and exasperating uh, forces, uh, uh, competition of, of equal forces I've ever seen. And it just went on forever. It got a very complicated story. That sees Henry, I'm sorry, that sees Claw and Erlinger sue Henry, countersuit, then on and on and on, several, anyhow. Finally in 1921, the patient and determined Henry got what he wanted and sold the movie rights to a corporation formed especially for that purpose. They had to form a special corporation to be able to afford it. They sold it for an unheard, unheard, this is 1921, an unheard of sum of $600,000. By contrast, the movie rights to Gone with the Wind, which was already spectacularly popular, were sold in 1938 for $50,000. <laughs> so, Henry and the Wallace estate got a huge pot of money, but two years later, it could depend on it, so did Abe Erlinger, who was one of the three partners who bought the stuff. And then he sold it to Sam Goldwyn for another huge pot of money. Never has so much cash changed hands for the purpose of filming a novel. And then, for the first time, the control of Ben-Hur directly or indirectly, pass out of the hands of the Wallace family. Erdinger was close to Goldwyn and to this remarkable woman, Jane Mathis. The woman Goldwyn already had in mind to adapt Ben-Hur for the screen. Mathis was perhaps the best known of the scenarists in Hollywood and had just completed Rex Ingram's Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse for Metro Pictures. Anyone seen that too? It's a wonderful film. Oh, it's so exciting. Both Erlinger and Mathis had very definite ideas about making Ben-Hur, the most important of which was that it should closely follow the plot and characterizations of William Young's stage play, and it should be filmed in Italy. To direct the project, Mathis chose Charles Braben, who was perhaps best known at the time for having recently married the vamp star, Beta Barra. And to portray the general's 17-year-old Judah, Mathis chose the 36-year-old George Waltz, Walsh, one of her exes. <laughs> Don't, oh, laugh. Oh. Don't laugh, he can't help you. <laughs> Much more important in the long run was the fact that Mathis had already written a 180-page screen scenario for Ben-Hur. What's a scenario? A scenario for silent films consists uh, of plot developments, instructions for staging, costumes, and lighting, maybe inner titles, the, 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 the captions, and so forth. Mathis's adaptation for Ben-Hur laid the foundation for what would become the final screenplay for the silent Ben-Hur, and it basically followed the characterizations and plots of the young play. But Mathis's connection to the film of Ben-Hur was very brief. When Samuel Goldwyn bought, bought the movie rights to Wallace's novel, he was, uh, stick with me now, it gets complicated, he was in the process of selling his studio to Marcus Lowe, perhaps the leading movie impresario of his day. In negotiations that spread from 1923 to 1924, even as, even as filming was beginning to be done in Rome, Lowe purchased the Metro studio and Louis B. Mayer's studio and united them into the first giant movie studio, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, the celebrated MGM, Ta -da, with the roaring line. While those negotiations were going on, the filming of Ben Hur was continually plaguing in Italy, was <laughs> talk about primitive, was continually plagued with problems that finally threatened to bankrupt the new studio even as it was being born. With no one firmly in control in Rome, the production had problems with the Italian communists, as well as the new Mussolini government, with the hundreds of Italian extras who were essential to the film, 
and with the Italian workers who were needed to build the colossal sets, which included a huge arena and a fleet of Roman galleys. Finally, the, hum the, the huge production was stymied by the sun itself. The Americans were accustomed, of course, to working in sunny Southern California and had difficulties adjusting to the realities of the quite different Italian climate, especially during winter. By the way, Mussolini was very excited about the new film <laughs> until someone told him that the Romans were the bad guys. <laughs> How dumb was that? <laughs> Read the book. Mathis did not long survive the creation of the new studio. Mayer and Lowell quickly put the production under the control of the boy genius, Irving Thalberg, one of the most remarkable men in movie history, who at 26 was already on his way to ruling the world and was a force to be reckoned with. Thalberg, when he went to Rome, was appalled at how much money Mathis had spent, and he was not at all impressed by the footage that had been produced. In short order, he exerted control over the production. Braben was replaced by Fred Niblo. Ramon Navarro, who was often called the next Valentino, and who was also 26 years old, just like Thalberg, succeeded George Walsh as Judah. Finally, Mathis herself was demoted and was replaced by Met Bess Meredith and Carrie Wilson. By late 1924, Thalberg and Mayer directed that the entire production be dismantled and shipped to Culver City. <coughs> <coughs> but at one point, Louis B. Mayer came over here, over to Rome, <coughs> and he had his picture made. <laughs> he loved it. <coughs> in one of the chariots. Now, you come back in July, I will show you a lot of pictures being made of, of, of uh, celebrities having their picture made in a Ben-Hur chariot. Remember, Louis Rivera was there first. <coughs> <coughs> I have to deal with this in my own way, so if you pray, pray. <laughs> Back in California, there ensued, this is in early 1925, no, late 24, early 1925, there ensued probably the most hectic year in film history as MGM tried to do a whole new Ben-Hur. Much of what had been filmed in Italy was reshot, and many of the scenes that we see in the final film were shot for the first time. And the publicity department of the new MGM studio went to work building up interest in the film. Almost overnight, the studio constructed a new Circus Maximus on a huge vacant lot at the intersection of Venice and La Cienega in L.A., if you're familiar with the topography, just outside Beverly Hills. <coughs> outside of the site, they erected an enormous sign which counted... Whoops. That was not an enormous sign. <laughs> Which counted down the days until the beginning of the, until, until the filming of the Great Chariot Race. And on that day, a Saturday, this shows you how powerful MGM was, they in fact set, shut down Hollywood. They invited everyone to come to watch or to take part of the filming of the Chariot Race. <coughs> <coughs> and a who's who of the movie world showed up. That is how stars like Mary Pickford and Harold Lloyd <coughs> come to be listed as uncredited extras in the silent <laughs> film. One of those little people is Mary Pickford. And working on the second unit, film the race, was a young German immigrant named anybody? William Wyler. Oh. How young? Director of the 1959 film. He worked on the original <coughs> second unit for the, for the silent film. The silent Ben Hur was heralded as the biggest, most action packed movie ever made, and that it was. Even bigger than D.W. Griffith's Intolerance, the movie that he made to atone in 1916 17 for the birth of the nation. Taken together, 
The sea battle and the chariot race constitute a full fifth of the total length of the film. MGM built virtually an entire fleet of Roman galleys that turned out to be operational, if not exactly seaworthy. They built a, they, there's a difference it turned out. They built a second, a second Circus Maximus in LA. They used thousands of extras, and to film the chariot race, they used an unheard of 48 cameras that were located everywhere along the track, including under it. Watch for it when you see the movie. And under it, you see the horses going over you. And decades after the, before the advent of CGI, computer-generated images, they found a way to make the arena look much smaller and more crowded. They kind of built a basic set, and then they built little, uh, little, little uh, artificial uh, miniatures. And they, 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 they uh, built little strings of people that were on a, on a, on a, a kind of a rod, and you could move them, and they were looking at them. <laughs> well, that's what a lot of that up there is. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> because it's not really near anywhere near that tall. You got it? Okay, here we go. Sorry that wasn't even better, but even better than that. That's all I can do right now. All of the sets, not just the circus set, was huge. They built a Joppa Gate that was ridiculously high. Watch the movie when the Joppa Gate, which is about 17 stories high, high fall, is so obviously made of cardboard, it falls in huge <laughs> chunks. Anyhow, I don't have a good slide of that, but we're going to show the, the film uh, in September. But look at the size of this wall, oh, wow. which is real, <laughs> which dwarfs, dwarfs the people going through it. But for my money, the most impressive of the huge sets are the interior walls and columns of the buildings. Most of the interiors take place in rooms that look as big as the arena, and their walls are covered in what must have been miles of drapery. And just look at the size of the columns that are dwarfing Eros and Masala. Okay, I couldn't quite figure out how to put this one in, so this may not fit right now, so forgive me, but here it goes. One way to measure the impact of a cultural phenomenon is to ask of it a simple question. Did it create at least one urban legend that would not die? Yes. You understand the question? The silent Ben-Hur certainly did. Two, actually. Rumors started immediately about catastrophes during the filming of both the sea battle and the chariot race. First, the battle. Niblo had arranged that an explosive charge would be ignited in the bowels of one of the, this is back in Rome, one of the trireens when it was rammed, one of the ships, it rammed it and it, uh, and it, and it was supposed to go, uh, explode and it was going to start burning. But it's going to be controlled, right? And the Italian exorcists who were playing the Roman seamen were to jump into the water in panic. Well, they did. <laughs> it got rammed and the fire got out of control almost immediately. And here they are jumping in panic, but they're not pretending because they <laughs> could not swim. I was amazed to find out that in the 20s, there were tanks who couldn't swim. Notice you're surrounded by water. Three of them died, drowned. Or did they? Or did they? You'll never know. And MGM played it both ways. And the result was everybody stayed interested. The legend would not die. Well, how about the chariot race? There are several crashes of men, chariots, and horses in the silent film race. It sure looks like several horses were trampled and killed, probably some of the drivers too, but were they? Who knows? But the legend continued. Let the record show that hardly any film generates such legends at all, not even Cleopatra. They didn't have to have legends about Cleopatra and Richard Burton. They were all true. <laughs> the important thing about the silent Ben Hur is that it immediately produced two of them, and make of that what you will. The publicists at MGM were every bit as good at their job as the folks in the place in the place PR department earlier in the century, and some of the techniques that they used were simply the ones that they used to publicize the stage play. Lots of human interest stories about the stars and so forth. But they added a new dimension to traditional PR techniques, the most successful of which is what I would call the movie star endorsement ad, which would become much more prevalent in the 30s and 40s and would be the centerpiece of the PR campaign to sell the 1959 Ben-Hur. But they started here. 
My favorite one for the silent film is this ad featuring Ramon Navarro, Carmel Myers, and Mae McAvoy, extolling the allure of Ben Hur perfume, complete with a seductive picture of Ramon Navarro. <laughs> ben Hur opened at Lowell State Theater on Broadway in New York City in the last week of 1925 and was an instant, critical, and popular success. It ran for several years, even after the advent of sound in 1927, and finally brought in as much as $10 million. And it could have been actually closer to $20 million if you do the international stuff, which easily eclipsed its $4 million price tag. However, after MGM paid a Berlinger a very large percentage of that money, as per his very astute contract, he is a Berlinger, the studio did not make a lot of money. But it got something from Ben Hur that was even more important than money. At a time when moving pictures, picture shows, were still considered low-class entertainment by many, many, many people, the silent epic established MGM's reputation as the foremost maker of quality films. As the novel had made it okay for Americans to read, no, I'm mean, sorry, as the novel had made it okay for Americans to read novels, and the play had made it acceptable to go to the theater, the 1925 Ben Hur gave Americans permission to go to the picture show. I have a couple of slides that justify Henry Lane Wallace's delaying tactics as he played with, with one movie, movie mobile after another, waiting for the movie industry to mature in the 1910s. Here is a very bad photograph of one of the temporary movie theaters that showed the 1907 Callum film before it was shut down. There's not a lot of money going on here, right? <laughs> very, very primitive. Here, only 18 years later, is the line of people waiting to buy tickets at Lowe State Theater on Broadway in December of 1925. And here is the crowd on opening night. Way to go, Henry. <laughs> What did these first nighters see in December of 1925? Well, let's begin by mentioning one thing that they did not see. They did not see the face of Jesus. Erlinger insisted that MGM abide by the general's instruction that the Son of God should not be portrayed by a mere mortal. In fact, following Erlinger's wish, Mathis at first insisted that Jesus be portrayed by a shaft of light just as it had been in the, origin, in the stage play. Matthews' original final scene on Palm Sunday had the shaft of a shaft of light moving with a huge crowd of people toward Jerusalem until the shaft of light encounters the lepers waiting by the side and the shaft of light cures them. Now that's, that's handled very nicely in the stage play. It doesn't really, you don't see it. Judah sort of goes to sleep, he's tired, and he has a vision that that thought he saw. Then he wakes up, and it was all true. <clears throat> the technicians probably persuaded Mathis that it would be very difficult to use a shaft of light to represent Jesus over the course of a two-hour movie. <laughs> if not a shaft of light, then, what did they see? Jesus was, in fact, played by a real actor, an uncredited actor named Paul I'm sorry, Claude Payton. Now, I couldn't find a good picture of him, except in a, in a later cowboy. See, here is a cowboy girl. Notice his name is Claude, Claude Payton. The man who plays Jesus in the 1959 film, Claude Heaton. The tribute for the day. <laughs> they never saw this mere mortal's face. They saw parts of his body, or... In the instance of the Last Supper, his nimbus, mm -hmm. with his strategically located disciples hiding the face. One of my students in my Jesus in America class at UT called the silent Ben Hur's Jesus, body parts Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Most often we see a hand, at times a ghastly white hand. Whom else did the first nighters see? During the negotiations with various movie moguls and stars that were in and around 1920, someone suggested that he should try to get Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks to, pay, to play Esther and Judah. Go for the top. Giving you some idea of how, how ambitious it was. 
Henry said, no, nah, he was not interested because stars of that magnitude would take up too much of the profits. Oh. <laughs> it's Henry Wallace, yes. So, if not the biggest names in Hollywood, whom did they see? In Ramon Navarro, MGM found a Judah who was at night 26, about the age of Wallace's hero at the end of the tale, which takes Judah from around age 17 to around 28 at the time of the crucifixion. How's this for a glamour shot? Mathis made tons of them. By the way, think about it. Wallace's hero would be a very difficult role to cast in a film. Judah is only 17 years old at the beginning of the novel, a mere boy. But he beefs up during his three years at the Oars, and then in the years of five years of martial training at Quintus Arius' his palestra in Rome. So he's a big hunk at the end. The many actors who portrayed Judah from 19, before 1925 ranged from a man named Herbert Rodiger. Rodger. Does anyone happen to know who he was in, in Ben-Hur history? Larry, do you know? I've heard the name. See, this is the guy who's in that 19... This is Judah, Judah in the 1907 film. Then Herman Rodger. Well, he was in fact 26 years old, just like Judah. I mean, just like uh, uh, Navarro. But the last person to play Judah in the stage play was a man named Richard Buehler. Here he is. Kiddos, he was 44 years old. <laughs> Heston was 36. Jack Houston was 33. Navarro, to be truthful, was too slight and, let's face it, pretty to convincingly play the beefed-up charioteer who had, been, who had been made preternaturally muscular by his three years at the oar and later stuff. But Navarro did an adequate job of making believable Wallace's coming-of-age story. Ben Hur is a buildings roman, a coming-of-age story. It's hard, and no adaptation of, of Ben Hur has ever quite pulled it off, because it's, it's just hard. Apparently, you could have the boy Judah, or you could have the man Ben Hur. It's hard to have both. Bushman, at 44, was way too old to play Misawa, and was not nearly as successful as Hart's original portrayal of Misawa which Wallace declared was exactly as he wrote it. Carmel Myers turned Eris into the definitive vamp. Mm -hmm. Betty Brownson, who almost got star billing, billing for her, her brief portrait of, of, of Mary, had just played Peter Pan. <laughs> she was a very successful Peter Pan. Mae McAvoy, who played Esther, was relatively unknown in 1925. And then she married, finally, she did marry a United Artists executive and retired for a while. Her last appearance on film, this is your second trivia question thing for today. Her last appearance on film was as an uncredited, uncredited woman in crowd in the 1959 Ben-Hur. Claire McDowell, the princess of her, the mother of her, had just appeared in the big hit, huge hit, The Big Parade. Nigel de Brulier, who plays Simonides despite his Anglo-French name, was English and had just appeared in Mathis's Four Horsemen. De Brulier was a constant source of difficulty for the MGM group, who took over the production and came close to being fired several times. In general, the Mathis scenario, even after it was shortened and simplified by Meredith and Wilson, followed the plot and characterization of William Young's stage play. In that way, it solidified the changes in the novel that Young had already made, and they were significant. Wallace's Masala is the least developed of all his characters, but the play and the silent film turned him into an even more wooden and monochromatic villain, utterly without complexity or nuance. Eris, on the other hand, is the only truly fully developed character in the book. I've always thought of her as the general's very ambiguous take on the new woman of the late Victorian period. Lou clearly admired his strong, willful, evil character. Smart, intelligent, kind, but evil. But then he didn't quite know what to do with her. <laughs> 
he finally kills her off in the epilogue, sort of. But she does it on her own terms. The play began the process of reducing Iris's role in the story and turning her into a simple caricature of the evil woman. The film continues that process. In the film, she has no connection with Balthasar at all. <clears throat> and she is merely a ridiculous courtesan who has whose only role is to serve Masala. Note the absurd peacock costume <laughs> that she wears to the race. You'll see it in a minute. But as they reduced the role of the evil woman, both the play and the film gave Wallace's heroine, Esther, an even greater role in the story than she has in the novel. In both the play and film, Esther assumes much more of the task of getting the lepers to Jesus. And here she is in that German expressionistic design of the, for the grotto where the lepers live. In the novel, that courageous deed of getting the, the lepers to Jesus is performed solely, slowly, I mean solely, by the little Egyptian slave Amra, who all but disappears in the silent film. Moreover, in this, by this scenario, Esther even gets to drive her own chariot. <laughs> who knew? <laughs> After the race, in the, novel, in the movie, she hears of the plot between Gratus and Masala to kill Judah. She commandeers a chariot, races to warn Judah, and then faints at his feet before she accomplishes the mission. The silent film also continues the process, begun by the play, of turning Esther's father, the noble Simonides, the steward of the house of her, into a caricature of Jewish cunning and greed. The play and film also diluted the theological content of Wallace's Tale of the Christ. The novel devoted long and tedious chapters. If you read the novel, you <laughs> remember the long and tedious chapters about the mission of Jesus. Is he? Why is he, why is he, why is he here? Was he the Messiah who had come to establish an earthly Jew, uh, Jewish kingdom, as Simonides argues? Or was he Balthasar's savior of souls who came to earth to redeem all mankind? All of that disappears, first on stage and then on film. In its place is only an injunction to believe. What one is supposed to believe is never stipulated. It finally boils down in the movie to the leper's pitiful cry that they believe that Jesus can heal them. Well, that's not really much of a stretch because just before they say, I believe, they just saw Jesus, who's carrying his cross, bring back to life a dead little girl. Do the math. If they can do that, they can do it anyhow. We believe. What we believe, we don't know. At the end of the film, Judah reassures his mother and Esther that Jesus is not dead, but will live forever in the hearts of men. It's not exactly the Christian gospel. Uh, he's supposed to be living in heaven, and if you are a Christian, you're going to go to heaven with him. To return to our first nighters for a moment, did they experience anything that we cannot experience today when they saw the film? And what would the answer to that question would be? You can see the film, right? But we can't hear what they heard. Unless you go to Hollywood and go to the MGM studio. They could hear the original score of Ben-Hur, composed by a man named William Axt, who had just written the score for that big movie, The Big Parade, and would later compose the score for David Copperfield. David Lean's David Copperfield, 35, 36, have you ever seen that? Beautiful film and a wonderful score. But the original score of Ben-Hur was a rather strange, I wish I could play it for you, but it's out there. And the person who has the who has a who has a, 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 a copyright right now won't release it for any reason. Uh -huh. Look, she's fascinating. Her name is Gillian Anderson. She lives in Washington D.C. and she has her own orchestra. And she has contracted with I don't know who actually. I don't know who this would be with. She has arranged the act's score, and she goes around uh, with symphony orchestras. And, and <clears throat> plays the original film, but with her uh, axed score. Mm -hmm. I've seen it, and I think, 
I've, I've, I've listened to seen it three times. Very strange. It was a strange melange of Protestant hymns, especially Ferris Lord Jesus. All right. Ferris Lord Jesus is the Jesus theme of the film, the Christ theme. And along with that are various examples of rather exotic Orientalist melodies and a very curious accompaniment of the chariot race, which folks is in three, four times. The chariot race becomes a waltz. <laughs> First time I heard it, I thought, say what? <laughs> I saw it in New York City once uh, at a screening. And this man, this is two hours and three minutes long, no intermission. He sat there at that piano and played for two hours and 20 minutes. Wow. I thought, no way in hell I could do that. <laughs> <clears throat> a few years after Ted Turner brought the MGM library in 1980s, I say library? <laughs> <laughs> library in, 19, in 1986, TCM, his company, reissued the silent Ben Hur. And we're going to see that. And commissioned the American composer Carl Davis to compose a score for it. Now, it's a perfectly good example of modern film music. It's heavily influenced by Wagner, you're going to hear it tonight, and by the earlier film scores of composers like Max Steiner and, hello, Miklos Rosa, who wrote the 1959 Ben-Hur score. As you will see in a minute, the score does not draw attention to itself because it sounds just like it ought to. <laughs> it's like just a nice religious film. Well, especially with the Wagnerian use of the threefold Dresden Amen, Amen, Amen. You know the Dresden Amen? You want to hear it tonight. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the Jesus uh, uh, theme in this film. Trust me, the 1925 score would not sound right to you. It sounds very strange. It's all very dis it's, uh, it's, it's discordant. It's not, uh, it's not composed straight through. It's very episodic. And you can hear it only if you go to a film studio and see the original print, which I've done, or see it screened in the film society, which I've done, I think, two or three times. In a way, it's a real shame that Ted Turner decided to modernize the score. It's rather like colorizing black and white film. It just doesn't work. So we can't hear what they heard. But we can see some of the things that the first nighters cannot see. We can see some of the scenes from the cutting room floor. And I'm going to take you out to the cutting room floor of the 25 film. One of the reasons why Mathis was, was fired and the production was turned to California was because the Italian company had filmed miles, and I'm not kidding, miles of film that couldn't be used. The Mathis scenario called for filming virtually all of the important scenes of the novel, as well as many scenes of the life of Jesus. The original Mathis score was going to be a real tale of the Christ. She sent the company to Egypt and Tunisia to film the desert scenes. You see them in the, in the nativity scene in the, original, in, in the 25 film, including the flight into Egypt. Most of those scenes have disappeared long ago. But MGM made still photographs of many of them, and the Lilly Library at IU has a magnificent collection of 400 of them. And I spent a wonderful winter week trying to figure out what these are. So I made copies, and I've been mulling for a long time. So here we go. One of the things, just I've already shown you one of them. Remember Esther and the Chariot? That's one of them. That's, that scene is in the scenario, so you know what it is. That's Esther going to help Judah. The same is true of these two scenes. Here are two men, one of whom we know is Simonides. They're talking. But who's the other guy? He's not in the film. Well, I couldn't figure out who he is until I saw this one. What's he standing by? A cradle. Thank you, Molly. A cradle. And on the other side of him is a? A bed. A birthing bed. Folks, you're looking at the birth of Judah Ben-Hur. You've never seen Ithamar 
Ben Hur. <laughs> this is the original Prince of Hur. Who knew? All right. Matthews had the wonderful idea of having Judah and Jesus born on the same day. <laughs> and she apparently planned to have a split screen, and on the, and on one side is two little baby fists, little hands. Jesus is out open like this. Judas is a little clenched fist. <laughs> Wish I could see that. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. And here are three very, very feathery <laughs> angels <laughs> who attended the birth of Jesus. Oh, wow. <laughs> <sighs> Excuse me. All right. We also know that this is a scene, this is not in the original film, this is a scene of two spies returning from Jerusalem to tell Quintus Arius, Judah's adopted uh, father, and Judah that Gratus the bad guy still reigns in Jerusalem and he can't go back. And so Judah says, yuck, I can. We also know that, 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 that Thalberg was infuriated when he went to uh, Rome to see that Mathis has spent a ton of money building and then filming a huge treadmill. She wanted to represent the oppression of the Jews by the Romans. So she had enslaved Jews pushing this huge treadmill lashed on by Buddhist Romans. At one point, apparently, the always playful Roman Rivera decided to see if he could do it, that he could do the treadmill himself. <laughs> And this is actually interesting now. Take your minds out, your mind back to the 2016 film. Judas, June Mathis, in the early 20s, apparently toyed with the idea of having the crippled Masala who survives repent. Here is Richard uh, Bushman, Francis, Francis Bushman. Still with way too much eye makeup. <laughs> Being very sad. And I don't know what the slave is doing, but I bet you anything that she was toying with the idea of, re of having him repent and redeeming Judah, which has become a theme of Christian adaptations in the late 20th century of Ben-Hur. You're going to see this again. All right, we got all that figured out. Thank you. But what on earth is this a picture of? Can you see that? Can you see it? It's a crucifixion. This is obviously a two Christian tomb. Well, what is it doing? This man, what's he doing? I don't know. Then it finally occurred to me, this may be from the epilogue of Ben-Hur. Mm -hmm. That Judah gave all his money to build a huge church in the catacombs. Maybe that's it. But aren't the catacombs underground? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm, son. And then I saw this. I got that all figured out, and then I saw this. I have a clue. The same man, he's a, probably a blind beggar. And now he's just sort of watching over these two men. So this is my continuing puzzle, but if you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> what did the silent film add to what I have called the Ben-Hur tradition in American culture? It, of course, solidified the emphasis on size and spectacle and the unprecedented and unending popularity of Ben-Hur as a literary property. It carried on the process whereby the novel and the play had helped blur the lines between religion and popular culture in America and made it easier for America to participate in popular culture without ceasing to be religious. But by surviving all of the challenges and vicissitudes of its productions, particularly in uh, Italy, the silent film added to all of those emphases a dimension of triumphing over great odds, just like Judah ben Hur did. I want to share with you now several scenes from the silent film itself. The first is a compilation of films 
of film scenes that I had made for me at UT when I taught this course on, on uh, Ben-Hur. It's a compilation of scenes beginning with the title. You will hear Carl Davis's grand score announce his Jesus theme, the Dresden Amen. Then we go on to the Nativity. And like Wallace's Virgin going to Bethlehem, Bronson's Mary here seems to be led by some force beyond her. She's being led just like the, the wise men are being led. Then, she pose, then we have the nativity. She poses for a long Madonna take. It's really kind of cute. Complete with frolicking lamb. Remember the 1959 film? The nativity scene has a frolicking calf. Do you remember that calf that bounds across? No, you no, don't. No. Yeah. This is a lamb. Don't lie to me. Oh, go ahead, lie to me. Next we see the scene at the well in Nazareth in which Jesus gives Judah a drink of water. And here will be your first uh, look at body parts Jesus. <laughs> you can see Jesus, he puts down his saw, and you can see him come and stand by Judah, and he has a cup. Now he's standing up, he's not bending down, the legs aren't bent, and I can't do this, but imagine that my arm comes out below my knee. <laughs> I don't make these things up, just check it out. It's really kind of funny. Okay. Here we also get a good example of Navarro's histrionic acting style. He can really eat up scenery. Then we get to a segment of the chariot race. Don't really need to say much about that. It is simply magnificent. But what I want you to do is check out Masala's eye makeup. And then Iris's peacock outfit. You'll also see that Masala doesn't die. In fact, you will see Bushman having to make the point that he's, he doesn't die, so he does like this. As they're dragging him out of the wreckage. <laughs> I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> then we see the stoning of the woman taken in adultery. Notice white hand Jesus is right up to the top of the screen as he, as he says... Uh, uh, let him who is without the sin cast the first stone. They all, these these uh, segments from the life of Jesus always have a kind of a, a kind of a, a ancient looking background that says Luke with the U's looking like V's and stuff like that. So you know it's authentic. <laughs> okay. okay. Then you see the healing of the lepers by Jesus on Good Friday. Notice how the miracle happens now. These women don't really look like they have leprosy. They look like they have on too much makeup. <laughs> and, the, and, and that's the only, and, and, and they're, they're dressed in black, but they just have on lots of makeup. Well, they have on red a makeup, tons of it. And the cameraman uses a red lens, put it over it, and the red disappears. And so gradually, it, it cures no more leprosy. This was perfected in. Oh my God, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the, 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 the cameraman who, who perfected that technique of watching Jekyll turning to Hyde, this, that's what the same thing is, okay. All right, the soldiers then cast lots at the foot of the cross, we see Jesus' ghastly white hand for the last time, and then the conclusion with Judah reassuring his women that Jesus will live forever in the hearts of men. I give you...
No wise men in this clip. Just the shepherds. <coughs> Check out the lamb. <coughs> this is actually a very Roman tableau. people are chopping their ears up or, <laughs> or bowing their heads. <laughs> this Joseph is very, very old. <laughs> he was old 30 years ago too. <laughs> however long it was. Notice this Decurian, the horrible Roman. William Wyler found him because he said he wanted him to be the, the, the Decurian in the 59 film, and they found him. Same man. his eyes can get. He's a real mess. <laughs> that stuff in his mouth. Now this dude responds to touch. He does never look at Jesus' face, which is so important in the 59 film. He ever looks at Jesus.
Get the crashes. He's already healed the baby, uh, raised the baby from the dead. And he's already told Judah to put away his sword.
I ask you indulgence just for another minute. I want to share with you my favorite scene from this film. It's actually one of the most wonderful pieces of silent filmmaking ever made. Judah has just returned from Antioch. He's gone to his, the house of his fathers, but it's all locked up. He's sleepy. He goes to sleep outside. His mother and his sister have just been released from prison. They come to the house. They see him. Nothing else need be said.
I subtitled this lecture, The Epic End of an Era. The Silent Ben-Hur was exactly that. The 1925 film was finally a magnificent success and enormously popular. But it was a silent film. Within two years of its premiere, the first talkie, what was the first talkie? The jazz singer. Someone said it. The jazz singer. The jazz singer. Al Josen, the jazz singer. Thank you, Tim. It was released, 1927. In the four decades before 1925, Lou Wallace's story of Judah Ben-Hur and the son of Mary in one form or another was never far from the center of American religion and popular culture. After 1930, that was no longer the case. The ensuing three decades, the period of the Great Depression, World War II, were the only period of time since its publication in 1880 that the general's tale of the Christ virtually disappeared in American culture. And when MGM remade Ben-Hur almost 30 years later, they had to essentially reintroduce Wallace's story to the American public. The silent film also ended the era in which Ben-Hur's fortunes were controlled by the Wallace family and by businessmen and artists in the Midwest, New England, and New York City. With the silent film, that control shifted first to Hollywood, and then in our time, it went global. The stage play began that shift with its international tours. The silent film continued it with the decision to make the film in Italy. That process would continue throughout the 19th and into the 20th centuries. But if the silent Ben-Hur ended an error, the 1959 epic began a new one. And that is where we will start when I return to the study in July. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Howard.